This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy presents The Dianea House Credited to Eric Hesserer Ten seven two thousand four. Jennifer, friends and family of Mark. As promised, here are copies of the correspondence I received from Mark over the course of the last month. For the most part, I have merely copied and pasted them from my email application. As you'll read, he requested this, in hopes that you'll better understand why he did what he did. I made this site because it's the most efficient way to share Mark's emails with all of you. I'm not advertising this to anyone, but I do think it'd be wise to pass this URL along to anyone who may help with the investigation. As I collect more information from various sources, I'll update this site to keep an accurate record. I'll have the link at the end of the series as well. If you need to speak with me, Jen has my number. Thank you for your patience, and again, I am profoundly sorry. Eric. 9-6-2004 From Condry, Mark Date Monday, September 6, 2004 817 AM Subject An old friend Eric Hey man, it's Mark from Houston Saturday night gang Feels like a long, long time ago, doesn't it? I found your email from your website. Looks like you're out in L.A. now. Cool. I remember telling you you should be out there, doing the California thing. You still with Connie? I'm in Dallas now. I met someone who works in my building. We've been seeing each other for two years now. Listen, the reason I'm writing you out of the blue is because I got this newspaper article in the mail. Maybe you got one, too. It's about Andrew. You remember Drew? Travis would pick him up most of the time. Messy hair, sort of the fanboy type. I didn't remember his last name until I got this thing. And now it's really disturbing me. Do you know what happened? Did you hear about it already? Let me know if you have some time to talk. I can call you or you can call me if that works better. I'm going to see if I can track down Travis and Dave. A quick search didn't seem to turn up any leads. But maybe they just don't have websites. If you still talk to either of them, let me know. Thanks. Mark. 9-8-2004 From Condry, comma, Mark Date, Wednesday, September 8th, 2004 7.44 a.m. Subject, re an old friend. Eric, thanks for the quick reply. I didn't mean to sound cryptic in my first email. I'm just reluctant, I guess. I hadn't seen or thought about Andrew since he stopped showing up for game night. That was five years ago. That was about the time we all went our own ways, back in 1999. You moved out west, I moved up to Dallas, etc. So when I got this article in my mailbox, it caught me by surprise. And yeah, I'll transcribe the thing for you. I wasn't sure if maybe you were the one who sent it to me. I'll put it into this email at the bottom. I remember him. He was never the kid with the idea. He was the kid who agreed with yours. Slowest to get the joke, usually laughed the longest. That's Andrew in a nutshell, yeah. At least, that's how I remember him. He got on my nerves sometimes, but damn if he didn't love being part of the gang. 
He'd ask me for some poker chips on card night or borrow dice from my bag, that sort of thing. Whenever we played Tecmo Bowl on your Nintendo, he always wanted to be on my team. Which would have been fine if he was any good. I haven't heard from Travis or Dave in years. They fell off the radar about the same time you did. None of us made much attempt to stay in touch. It was just one of those things. That's okay. I wasn't trying to point fingers. It happens. But I was hoping you'd already heard about Andrew, like you'd gotten a copy of the article. I still haven't been able to get a number or email for Travis or Dave. Maybe they know more about this than we do. Andrew usually hitched a ride with Travis most of the time. He was on the way home for Travis. Didn't Andrew live with his mom? Like, in an apartment? And his stepdad was a real estate broker. Had that one house way out past Highway 6. You remember that? Andrew was scared to death of that house. Here's the article. There's a photo of Andrew with it. Looks maybe like his driver's license photo. Still had messy hair. Gunman shoots to, kills self in Boise restaurant. Diners at the Roadside Breakfast Cafe on Interstate 84 fled to the parking lot in a panic yesterday afternoon when a man entered and began shooting patrons inside, killing two. The couple, John and Lucy Madsen, were having lunch when 26-year-old Andrew Hughes entered wielding a Smith & Wesson 59 pistol, according to police. Witnesses claim the perpetrator was muttering to himself as he approached the smoking section and opened fire into the first occupied booth, fatally wounding the Madsons. Soon after, he turned the weapon on himself. All three were taken by paramedics to St. Adolphus Regional Medical Center, where John Madsen and the shooter were pronounced dead. Lucy Madsen, 37, remained in critical condition for several hours but did not survive the night. Police are investigating Hughes' work and personal background, but as of this morning, a motive for the attack is unknown. If there's more to the article, I didn't get it. That's where I was torn off. The other side is part of a Dillard's ad. This is really bothering me, Eric. What the hell was Drew doing in Boise? With a fucking gun? He hung out with us for almost two years. I just don't get it. And something else is eating me. I can't figure it out yet. Mark. 9-9-2004 From... Condry, comma, Mark. Date, Thursday, September 9th, 2004. 2 p.m. Subject, Andrew. Hey, I know how you feel. It's hard not to think of the times he sat next to us at the table, smiling like a fool, rolling dice and moving his pieces around the board. He loved Monopoly night. Always wagged his tongue when he counted the money. I don't think he realized he did that. It's impossible to think of him shooting up a diner. There's no return address on this envelope? No, but the postmark is Idaho, not California or Texas. Not sure if you've already considered this, but it's possible the whole thing is a fake. Some sick practical joke made to mess with your head. You can get newsprint paper for... Yeah, I've considered it. I didn't tell you this earlier, but I called up St. Adolphus and asked if they had a patient named Andrew Hughes admitted in the last month. They had no record of him. I asked if it would show if he'd been pronounced DOA. I got transferred to the ER, where they keep paramedic records and info on all DOAs. They have him listed. He showed up on August 28th, died of a gunshot wound to the head, pronounced dead by ER resident at 3.14 p.m. I asked for some contact info, like a phone or address where he might have been living. I got brushed off, told to call the police for that stuff. The hospital wouldn't give out any personal info, at least not without some signatures. I haven't called the police yet. That's probably the next step. Glad to hear you and Connie are going strong. Sorry to dump all this on you. I just don't know who else would care to listen. I'll write if anything else comes of this. At this point, I'm thinking maybe Drew's mom sent it to me. Maybe Drew kept track of me when I moved to Dallas and had my address. I'm listed in the book. That would explain the logistics part. I'm overthinking things. Take care. Mark. 9-10-2004 From Condry, Mark Date, Friday, September 10th, 2004 
2004, 311 AM. Subject, thoughts and concerns. Hey again. I know it's late or early, depending on how you look at it, but this Andrew thing won't go away. I finally realized what's eating at me, and I need to spit it out. Do you remember what went on just before Andrew stopped showing up for game nights at your place? I do. He was gone for two weeks because he had to house sit for his stepfather. Mom and stepdad went on a big vacation every summer for like ten days, and Andrew was just expected to stay behind. He usually just stayed at his mom's apartment, but that year he was asked to mind that house his stepdad owned. The one in that old rich subdivision west of Houston. Maybe the guy had a bunch of houses. He was big on real estate, wasn't he? The guy had inherited this dog from one of his clients. Someone who moved out and didn't want to take the dog with him. I want to say it was an Australian Shepherd. Do you remember any of this? Andrew talked about it the weekend before. Dog had behavioral problems. Whine, bark, scratch at the door, pissed on the carpet. Didn't want to be inside, I always wanted to be outside. Dad kept it in a kennel except when it rained. Andrew was supposed to take care of the dog, plus a few other things like mow the lawn, that sort of crap. But Andrew didn't want to go. Dave got into this argument with him about how it was a perfect setup for a young bachelor. House all to yourself, party time, risky business. Andrew kept saying it was too cold there for a party. Too cold. I distinctly remember that. And how he kept asking us to drive out and stay with him while he was house-sitting. I don't think anyone went out there, did they? I never did. We didn't see him for two Saturdays in a row. Then Travis picked him up like usual since he was back at his mom's place. That's the one night with Andrew I remember the most. I bet it's the same with you. It was the most bizarre, frustrating night I had with the group. Andrew walked in quoting some commercial verbatim. I want to say it was a Tide ad. Travis told us he was like that in the car all the way over. Commercials, shows, movies, radio, songs. The first couple of hours gaming was like being in the room with the TV on. Then he started parroting us. He'd just start copying something we said, you remember? Tell me you remember this. I can see it in my head so clearly. Oh, what was his response to anyone's complaints? Okay. Drew, stop quoting Law & Order episodes. Please give the Pontiac commercial a rest. Dude, shut the fuck up and roll your dice. Okay. And then he'd launch into something else a few minutes later. It wasn't just that he'd regurgitate that crap. It was that he could take it so far. Whole reams of dialogue that he'd somehow memorized from one throwaway TV episode. Lyrics to entire songs. It went from odd to funny to disturbing in the first hour. Look, I'll come out and say it. Whatever happened in those 10 days, it changed him. He wasn't the same person after that. We all know this. We never talked about it, at least not with me around. But fuck if we didn't know instantly that the person who came back from that house was not Andrew. I wrote before that I hadn't thought about Andrew since 99. That was a lot. You know the way your brain sometimes reminds you of things you hate to dig up? The ones that sour your stomach? I've thought about them a few times. About that night. Was that the start of his madness? Or whatever it is that drove him to shoot up a diner? Were we there to see him first lose his grip? Jesus, Eric. Why the hell didn't we say anything? From Condry. Comma mark. Date, Friday, September 10th, 2004, 11.38 a.m. Subject, the door is open. Eric, I woke up to the phone ringing this morning. It turned out to be a reporter from the Idaho Statesman. She finally called me back. Did I tell you I called to track down the source for the article? She didn't have any new developments in the story, but continued to follow up with the police. I asked if she had any other details about the crime, stuff that didn't find its way into the article, and we sort of went over her notes. Most of it I already knew, but there was one piece of info that caught my attention. 
She wrote in the article that Andrew was mumbling or muttering to himself when he entered the restaurant, but she didn't put in what he was saying. According to witnesses, he kept repeating, the door is open. Does that make sense to you? The door is open? Write me back. Mark. 9-12-2004 From Mark Condry Date, Sunday, September 12th, 2004, 5-10 p.m. Subject, a plan. Eric, haven't heard from you. Just wanting to let you know I've had a day to put some distance from the whole thing and I've made a decision. I'm going to drive down to Houston and see if I can find someone in Andrew's family. I once rode with Travis to pick Drew up. I think I know where his mom used to live. From there, maybe I can find stepdad in the house. I've tried the boys' elite already. I called the cops and got more questions and answers. Now some Lieutenant Perez plans to call me back in case he needs more testimony from me. Like I know anything. Apparently Andrew is living alone in the rental up there, working at a blockbuster video. That's what all I got from the cops and Idaho. So I'm aiming for Houston. Even driving my own car in a cheapo motel. It's still going to cost me about 200 for the trip. Jenny's worried about me. She'd rather I stay and pretend the police will figure this out on their own. But I have to go down there, Eric. Here's why. I think Andrew was afraid of that house for a reason. Whatever that reason was, during those 10 nights, something emptied him. Gutted Andrew like a fish. He yanked out whatever he was inside, or shocked him into forgetting it all away. He was hollowed out. To fill the void, he absorbed any input he could find. Television, radio, conversation. Soaked it up and presented it as Andrew. He could walk and talk, and he wasn't injured, not physically. But he wasn't the same, either. There's a gap I need to fill, in my head. Like the time in that house. I have these pieces of Andrew that don't match. I need something to match. Hell, I'll even feel better if something will just make sense. I won't ask you to fly down and join me, but I could use your help all the same. I have some questions you might be able to answer. Please call me or send me a note if you know any of these. My phone is... What was the stepfather's name, first or last? What was his mom's name? Was her last name also Hughes? What was the name of the subdivision where stepdad's house was? I think Andrew mentioned it. I hope I haven't freaked you out too much with my crazy talk. I know it probably comes off sounding absurd. Some of it. Or maybe not. You were there for some of this. If you really think I'm off my noggin, tell me. By all means, tell me. Hope to hear from you soon. Mark. 9-13-2004 From Mark Condry Date, Monday, September 13th, 2004 8.22 a.m. Subject, re, a plan. Eric, thanks again for calling. I got your email as well, and it mentions a few things we didn't discuss over the phone, so I want to add a comment or two. What I remember is what Travis told us. The time he went to pick up Drew and had to go to his room to get him. This was the last time Drew gamed with us. Travis went upstairs to his room, and the kid was pacing back and forth by his bed. Everything was all neat and tucked in, but the carpet was worn in a line where Drew was pacing, like it's all he did. Yes, I remember this too. And the way Travis told the story, like he wanted it to sound funny, but he didn't believe it was. And Dave laughed. He said, man, that dude's a broken record, and we all agreed, nodding and chuckling. Fuck. We all just let it go at that. Like it was easier to write him off. But Travis was the last one to laugh. He'd seen the room with his own eyes. Go. I really would. But Connie got sick last night, and she's still throwing up this morning. I don't feel right leaving town with her like this. Understandable. You stay there. I'll continue to email you on this thing. I can't really talk about Drew with Jenny. She never knew him. She doesn't get why this is so disturbing outside of the horror that took place in Boise. 
That's why I keep writing you. Nobody else gets it. Hey, maybe I'll somehow find Travis and Dave while I'm in town. Um. 9-14-2004 From Mark Condry Date, Tuesday, September 14th, 2004 6.51 p.m. Subject, I made it. He made it to Houston. The tribe was hell. Traffic and a persistent rattle in the trunk wore me down. The AC unit in my motel room sounds like a submerged Cessna engine. It would be hard for me to sleep with it on and impossible with it off. Well, at least the whole internet access bit works. And I'm able to check my email. Tomorrow's a long day. I'll be prowling Brazewood in your old neighborhood to zero in on an apartment complex I went to once. Joy. Wish me luck. Mark. 9-15-2004 From Mark Condry Date Wednesday, September 15th, 2004 9.06 p.m. Subject, lots of stuff. Eric, great news. I have a solid lead. The whole day felt like I was pulling a string from the sand, but it's pointed me in the right direction. These emails are becoming more of a journal for me to help me log my progress. I hope you don't mind. It took me an hour of driving back and forth around the Gessner and Brazewood area before I zeroed in on the right side street. The landmarks had changed. I was 90% sure I'd found the right apartment complex, but I was still grasping air. With no name for Drew's mom and no guarantee her last was Hughes, I went to the manager's office. And I just got lucky. Her name is Nancy Hughes, and she stopped paying the rent in September of 1999. Drew paid it for the rest of the lease term, which ended the following February. According to the note in the resident file, he paid in cash. Seems mom moved out or just up and left one day. Poof. Andrew was living alone in the apartment then. How was he paying for rent with just a minimum wage job? I showed the manager the article about Andrew, and then I lied. I said I was a private investigator. I don't know why. Maybe to justify why I was having to dig up rental information from five years ago. Anyway, she got off on it and kept rooting around in the Hughes file for me, like a movie sidekick. She found something. A third-party check covered rent for December of 98. Kurt Malone. I'm thinking this is a stepdad. The manager photocopied the check for me, and ten minutes later I was calling the phone number printed with Kurt's address in the upper left-hand corner. No luck there. Disconnected. So I took another approach and called 411 for a local realtor service. You can do a search for contact information for a specific realtor. I remember hearing about this from a co-worker who'd sold his place in Greatwood. Malone was listed under a little Remax affiliate office in Katy. I got that number and called there and left a message. Evelyn, the owner, called back and said Malone hadn't worked there in forever. He up and vanished, left her with all kinds of issues. She thinks he had financial problems and bailed from Mexico. I find it hard to swallow a theory told to me in stage whisper, but maybe that's just her personality. Still, that's two people gone. Before I thought maybe mom just moved in with stepdad. Now I don't know what the hell to think. The call went on for half an hour as I got to hear the HR nightmare Evelyn went through thanks to Kurt's disappearance. Halting his benefits, freezing the 401k plan, surrendering documents to the police, etc. I finally broke in and asked about the house. The one out in West Houston he owned. She got very quiet after that. It took me another 10 minutes to answer her questions about who I was. This time I was honest and upfront with her. I guess it paid off because she believed me. Or at least believed in my intentions and checked her records. I have an address, Eric. Kurt had his own home in Sugarland, but get this. He was renting a house from a client, way out west, near Pecan Grove Plantation. The paperwork was curious since he was supposed to be selling this place, but the previous owners had signed off on it in multiple places, like it was no real conflict of interest. She didn't know what happened to the house after it was seized by the bank. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when I drive out there. I'm close, man. I'm real close. 9-16-2004 Note. Mark was able to send text messages from his phone, but I frequently received them late, sometimes hours after he sent them, as is the case with the September 21st messages. From 
removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Thursday, September 16th, 2004, 3.33 p.m. No subject. Where are you? Call me. From Mark Condry. Date, Thursday, September 16th, 2004, 8.25 p.m. Subject, the house. Holy fuck. I tried calling you five times today, but I got your machine. I really need to talk. Call me as soon as you can. Where do I start? The house is still there. It's this generic one-story thing, bricks and siding. It must have been built at the same time as the other homes in the neighborhood, but it just looks older. The roof is scarred in places. The driveway isn't held up like the others have. Cracks in the pavement. Plank is missing from the side gate. I rang the doorbell and figured just talk to the new owners. No one answered. I couldn't really hear if it worked or not. Blinds and curtains in the windows kept me from peering inside. There was a dusty pickup truck with a warped front fender parked in the driveway. The neighbor across the street saw me checking it out. He talked to me for a little while as he watered his shrubs. He hasn't met the person who lives in the house now, or if anyone's living there really. He remembered Kurt, but not by name, just as the guy who stayed there for a few months. The previous owners, Kurt's clients, didn't live there that much longer. They had all sorts of problems with the house, electrical, heating, that sort of thing. They moved out, left most of their furniture behind, he said. Packed into a big RV one day and just drove off. He still remembers their names. John and Lucy Madsen. 918, 2004. From Mark Condry. Date, Saturday, September 18th, 2004. 7.59 a.m. Subject, re, update. Hey Eric, we're playing phone tag. When you called, I was already on the plane. When I called back, I guess you were at the hospital again. Really sorry to hear about Connie. Any idea what it is yet? Food poisoning? Something else? What are the doctors saying? I'm in Boise now, yeah. I nabbed a ticket on short notice, got on standby. I left my car at the George Bush Airport in Houston. Jen freaked out when I told her. Then she got very terse said I should do what will make me happy, and hung up. What will make me happy? Christ. I don't know a soul in Idaho. I haven't slept in two days. I'm charging everything on my visa. I have no idea how I'm going to pay it off. My watch stopped working yesterday. I've got this weird ringing in my right ear. It comes and goes. Annoying as hell. I'll tell you what will make me happy. Closing my eyes and not seeing Andrew staring back at me. What are you going to do once you get there? Do you plan on telling the police the Madsen connection? Do you think the Madsons left something in the house that drove Drew nuts and he killed him for it years later? Seriously, this is fucked up. Yeah, I don't know what to think. Right now it's just a connection. They lived in the same house. The Madsons were there for four and a half months. Drew was there for ten days. I have no idea what that means. I'll email you when I figure something out. Feels like I should pass this along to some people. Like to get you some help out there. Or bring in the feds or something. I don't know if anyone has managed to make the connection you did. And it's an important one to the case. Can I forward your emails and contact info to someone? I've been thinking about that. Because I was going to ask you to do that for me at first. But now I don't think I'll get the kind of help I need. Let's face it. There are enough unexplained pieces to this thing. I'm going to get two kinds of interest, nuts and skeptics. I wouldn't mind so much the skeptic, except I get this vision in my head of some guy calling Jenny, calling my parents, calling my boss at work, looking to paint the picture of a guy who's lost his mind after hearing that his dead friend went nuts. I really haven't been totally honest with Jenny, or my supervisor at the office, because this is not something you can easily explain. I've been calling in sick to work. I told Jenny I had to go to Boise to attend a pseudo-wake. I don't want that to bite me in the ass while I'm looking into Andrew's past. Here's what you can do for me. You can hold on to this stuff as evidence or whatever. If something crazy happens, I'm in trouble. Use this to explain the situation for me. Forward emails to my friends or family. 
Maybe if they read them, they'll understand what I'm going through. I know you didn't mean to inherit this job. I'm sorry to make you do it, but I really appreciate the help. Mark, in Potato Land. 9-20-2004 From Mark Condry Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004 10 13 a.m. Subject, new lead. Update. I called the hospital, the one where Andrew was taken back in August and asked some pointed questions about where Andrew's body went. Who picked it up? Did a relative or friend show up? The answer was no. But he was tagged with John and Lucy, and I kept demanding some sort of lead, so the intern gave me the names of the relatives who were called in to confirm the IDs of the Madsons and to arrange the funeral home delivery. John's cousins live out here. I'm about to head out and meet Greg Archer, the cousin, and his wife. I'll write again from the hotel. M. From Mark Condry. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004. 10.40 p.m. Subject, The Archers. Back. That was... strange. I met the Archers. I know what you said last time I called. I need to stop lying because it'll make it harder on me later. But I wasn't about to tell them that I'm a good friend of a guy who killed Greg's cousin. I said I knew the Madsons when they were in Houston. I had some burning questions about what happened to them. As, I claimed, they practically dropped off the map when they left home. I hadn't heard from them since. Greg did most of the talking. His wife Helen was pleasant, in that stiff smile way. But she found ways to interrupt my chat with Greg and remind him of other things he needed to get done. The more she did it, the more I encouraged Greg to keep chatting. The Madsons, as he tells it, had a long future planned in Houston. John got a transfer to Schlumberger Oil and looked forward to settling down. Then things started to go wrong after they moved in. Just little things that pile up, like their car kept getting flat tires. Lucy broke her ring finger while futzing with the dishwasher. Trouble getting mail. Their phone got disconnected when they didn't pay the bill for two months. A bill they never got. That sort of thing. Finally, something happened. Greg doesn't know what. It was enough to get them to put the house on the market. That same week, John sold all his company stock, gutted his 401k, quit his job, put everything into a big RV. He and Lucy drove off in their new motorhome and never looked back. They've been driving around the country the last five years. Nomadic. Lucy got pregnant in 2002, but miscarried. They still kept on the road. Greg thinks they would have just kept driving through Idaho if the RV hadn't broken down with an AC problem. Greg says John called him up out of the blue and asked him if he and Lucy could stay over. Greg made a guest room upstairs, and he and Helen welcomed them in their house for a week. This was right before the shooting. Here's where it gets stranger. Greg took me up to the guest room and pointed to some spots on the carpet, right in front of the closet door. Furniture footprints. Like someone had stood there. Greg says it was a dresser, the one against the opposite wall. They barricaded the closet door for the duration of their stay. It was the strangest thing. He also noticed they kept the bedroom light on around the clock and bundled up with a spare set of woolen blankets for the bed. Greg never found the right way to ask a number of questions. I think he felt a little better talking to me about them. I'm not his cousin, but I'm someone who listened to him and agreed it was bizarre. I left Greg and Helen's not feeling any better. I feel worse now. I ache the way you're sore right before you get really sick. I'm trying to put things together. I really am. I have to go to the police now, don't I? I'll go first thing in the morning. I promise, Eric. 9 21, 2004. From Mark Condry. Date Thursday, September 21st, 2004. 2 21 a.m. No subject. Hey, I just saw this thing on Discovery Channel. Probably a rerun. I bet you can catch it sometime. All about natural predators and stuff. Wild things. Yeah, I'm up watching TV since I can't sleep. Anyway, they had this thing on the Venus flytrap talking about how it lures the curious insect to its lip and then these invisible hairs or something sense when one of the suckers land on it and wham! 
swallows the bug. Just like that. Later on, it spits out the skeleton of the fly and waits for the next victim. Some types of fly traps emit an odor to entice more food, says the voice on TV. The fancy name for them is Dianea muscapula. I wonder if that's all this is. The whole thing with the shooting and the anonymous article in Houston and the footprints on the carpet. It's all to get me into the Venus flytrap. Only the scent isn't sweet sap. It's guilt. Guilt over all those times I was around Drew and didn't do anything. You know what I mean? And I'm flying all over the fucking country and my head is buzzing. And I think I'm getting close to the truth, but... Really, I'm tickling some invisible hair and the ground is about to fold up on me and swallow me down into that place where Nancy Hughes and Ken Malone went. I'm gonna take some sleeping pills. I hope Connie's getting better, man. I miss Jen. She has a way of making me feel like I'm home just by being around her. I'm tired of motels. I'm sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. M. From Mark Condry. Date. Thursday, September 21st, 2004. 12.15 p.m. Subject. Where Andrew stayed. Eric. Bingo. I went to the police and asked to talk to Lieutenant Perez. Instead, I got Detective Sokolov. He said he was working the Hughes case now. I'm more inclined to think he was just running interference for Perez in case I was a wacko. Anyway, I told him about the Madsen connection with Andrew, to see if that would help. He said they'd look into it. Then he started with the questions about me, and I looked for a way to cut that chat short. Police stations make me uncomfortable. The rest of the talk was rather banal, but at the end of it, almost offhandedly, he asked if I wanted to sign for Andrew's personal effects, since they had copies of all the important stuff. I said sure, even though it made me feel like they'd already written off this case. Drew's been busy the last four years. He has driver's licenses in Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, California, and Idaho. Looks like he stayed at friends' homes because none of the addresses printed on the license have apartment numbers. His Idaho address is just two months old and has the address of a rental home where he stayed. I'm going to drop by this afternoon and see what happened to his things there. Maybe there's a clue to how he knew where to find the Madsons or why he shot them. Perez or somebody has done this already, I'm certain, but I'm not sure he looked very far. Wish me luck. Mark. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.14 p.m. No subject. Standing in front of house now. It's the same one. The Houston one. Same marks on roof, same fence damage. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.22 p.m. No subject. Just talked to old man across the street. He says house has been here for years, rented out as far back as he can remember. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.25 p.m. No subject. I rang the doorbell. No answer. It's exactly the same. Eric, I, I don't understand. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.29 p.m. No subject. It was ringing again. I don't know what to do. How is it the same? From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. No subject. There's a way into the house here. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. No subject. Where are you? Pick up the phone. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date, 
Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.38 p.m. No subject. I'm going inside. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. No subject. Inside the house. Nobody's here. Air is cold. Metal smell. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. No subject. I found stairs. Going up. Didn't see second story from street. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004. 4.47 4.47 p.m. No subject. Did you call? Signal cuts off. Three bars and no bar. I'm looking for more Drew stuff here. Layout is really bizarre. Lots of rooms. From. Removed. At messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date. Tuesday. September 21st. 2004. 4.47 p.m. No subject. Door at end of hall. Made of metal. Checking other rooms instead. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.05 p.m. No subject. Call? From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.09 p.m. No subject. Phone something. Drew's backpack. Getting out of here now. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.11 p.m. No subject. I think someone's here. I just heard something. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date, 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 Tuesday, September 21st. 2004, 5.77 p.m. The door is open. Nine twenty-seven, two 2004. From Mark Condry. Date, Monday, September 27th, 2004, 1.18 p.m. Subject, for Thursday. Hello, Eric. This is Jennifer. I'm on Mark's PC now. I did like you suggested, and I've looked through his outbox, and I don't see any emails about this to anyone else. There aren't that many, really. He didn't tell me a lot of this stuff, Eric. Like, now I'm reading the last thing he sent you back on the 13th. I didn't know he was so emotional. Why didn't he tell me about this? But anyway... Like you said, he wrote to you from his laptop when he was in Houston and Boise. And the police up there said that they found that in his hotel room. And they're taking their own sweet time checking it out for clues. So yeah, I'll keep asking for that to be sent down. Where else should I look? I don't know what else to do here except wait until you come down and look at it. He does have AIM, but I can't tell where the chat logs would be saved or anything if he's done that. Please tell me what else I can do. You know more about what he was up to than anyone else. Because of this old friend the two of you had who went crazy. And now Mark is missing for almost a week. Please send me the other emails he sent you. Please. I want to know now. Jen. 10-1-2004 From Postmaster Date Friday, October 1st, 2004 1.30 1.30 p.m. Subject. Undeliverable mail. From X at X dot X. Date. Friday, October 1st, 2004. 12.47 p.m. Subject. No subject. Human arm and leg bones found on street. Scottsdale residents got a shock at the start of their morning commute 
when they found what seems to be human bones lying in the road on Sage Drive. Crime scene technicians arrived within half an hour and began to sweep the scene for more evidence that might help identify this human victim, or at least establish an approximate time of death. Police spokesman Daniel Swift said bone evidence alone isn't usually enough to determine identity or even cause of death. These remains didn't just appear in the road. They moved here, Swift said. Therefore, we're asking any witnesses to contact the police with information that might pertain to what happened. No other evidence was found along Sage Street or in yards or neighboring homes. More on this story as it develops. Whoever you are, whatever you are, fuck you. I may not know you, but I can tell what this is, and I'm not fooled. Your Venus flytrap game won't work. I'll make damn sure to warn Jenny and others too. So, nice try. But no one is falling for your bait this time. It stops here. Updates. It has become painfully obvious that, although I want this to end, for all of us to have closure regarding Mark's disappearance, the trail he left has raised too many unanswered questions. Since the time I first published this site for Jen and those close to Mark, new information continues to arrive from a variety of sources. In my last posted email, I refused to take the bait. I said it would stop here. But it doesn't stop there. Not by any stretch. This page will chronicle my findings and other resources as I discover them. Some may have no connection to how or why Mark vanished. Only time will tell. A final note. For those of you like Sandra and Nathan Condry, the truth is, I don't yet know what to believe with this whole thing. But I know what I don't want to believe. 10-14-2004. Jen called. She spoke with Boise police again yesterday, and they finally agreed to ship down the laptop. Once she gets it and looks at it herself, she'll send it my way. If I find anything new, I'll add it here. 10 17, 2004. Among the spam today, I received this email from someone who seems to have stumbled upon the site. From Mr. Paranoia. Subject, the house. Well, regardless of how I feel about it, this site isn't for me. So in case you read it here first, send me what you have and I'll decide if I want to share it, Mr. Paranoia. Also, don't expect me to publish your messages to me ever again. I am not a PR firm. 10 2004 After trading emails several times with Mr. Paranoia, he finally sent the link mentioned in the 1017 email. Jen, I've read it already, and I want you to treat it as a hoax unless you get something in the mail from a grocery store in Arizona. Call me when you've read this and we'll talk. It's a live journal site, which means to read it chronologically, you need to scroll to the bottom of the page and work your way up. The journal author is allegedly a 16 year old named Danielle Stevens. Here's the link. 1026, 2004. Jen, please call me back. I know it must be driving you crazy, but do not go to Phoenix. Mark was never there, despite what the postmark says on that box. The keys are just like the article about Andrew. Bait. Please, please don't do this. Send me the laptop, and we'll figure it out together, okay? I wouldn't have to put this here if you'd answer your phone. I know you visit this page regularly. Call me. 1026, 2004. Late. Lots of responses. I didn't expect this. Thank you for your support and your technical notes. At this time, I cannot involve and will not involve anyone else for a number of reasons. Please respect my decision on this matter. I will keep the contact information for the paranormal investigators, and I will continue to help those close to Mark as best as I can. Please, no more phone calls. Connie's going out of her mind. Thank you. 1027, 
2004. Sandra, Nathan, check your email. I finally heard back from the Sprint PCS service rep today. No more account authorization hassles. He said their records show and have billed for only 14 text messages from Mark's phone on 921. The last one, timestamped at 511. He's sending me a copy of the logs, but I'm not sure if they'll do us any good at this point. Awaiting the laptop now. 1028, 2004. I've been contacted by Diane M, who says she was friends with Lucy Madsen when she lived in Houston. The attachment wouldn't open, but hopefully, Diane will try again. Update. I got the chat log and converted it to HTML. I don't know if Diane is still using her screen name or if Lucy's is taken by a new user now. So, to protect both from any unwarranted IMs, I have removed the numbers from the end of their NICs. If there are users with the NICs in this log, they are not the same people. Here is the AIM chat log. 10-29-2004 Laptop arrived. There's a lot to sort through here. Most notably, some pictures Mark must have downloaded from the camera phone. But his laptop wasn't equipped with Photoshop or any other photo app, so I can't see more than the thumbnails. I'll move them to my hard drive along with recent files and see what I can find. Also, it's crunch time at the office, so I'll be working this weekend, FYI. Maybe we all could use a little mental break from this. 1031. 2004. Hooray for automated FTP uploading. If this sees publication, it means I'm still not back from my trip to the never-ending suburban grid in the valley. Consider it a precautionary update. When I return, I'll remove this link since I can't stand sounding like some sort of martyr, nor do I like to cause a panic. In the meantime, in case it could wind up being important, I've been keeping a personal blog on a remote host. Don't worry about me, Connie. I'm sure I'll have quite a story to tell. Love, E. This is Connie. It has been nearly one year since Eric drove off and never came back. I don't know how to do HTML. I don't know if this is how Eric did things. I'll be doing good just to copy this page back onto the website. What has happened in a year? A lot. Not enough. I don't have any answers. Just a million questions. Let's see. I met Jennifer and Rachel, who is Cam's girlfriend. The three of us still keep in touch. Legally, Eric, and Mark and Cam, are considered missing. That makes some things very hard on us. What else? I have a mountain of files. Emails, letters, digital photos. That may or may not have anything to do with their disappearance. Every time I tried to start in, I got overwhelmed. So, last week, I hired someone to go through all of it for me and see if anything made sense. The reason I'm finally learning this thing is that he found one or two pieces to this puzzle, and I feel a responsibility to continue what my husband began. This is a test post. Later this week, after I hear back from Jenny, I will post more information. Kisses and hugs. C. October 12th, 2005. Well, for one reason or another, the new information has yet to be verified. So, until I hear back from my source, I can't post the link. Now I get how hard this is. You never know who is on the other end of a modem. Thanks for your patience. All three of you who are still reading. Kisses and hugs. C. October 14th, 2005. Despite the fact that she just used her diary to lash out at me, 
instead of answering me privately. I will link to a live journal by a woman who claims to know about what both Mark and Eric were investigating. Edit. Okay, I'm still figuring out the link thing. The blog of Laureen Mathers. Hoping that works. Kisses and hugs. See. For more information, including pictures and videos of the stories told on this podcast, or to suggest stories for future episodes, please visit us at CreepyPod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or email us at CreepyPod at gmail.com. All stories told on this podcast can be found at creepypastawikia.com and are protected by a Creative Commons license. Some rights reserved unless otherwise stated.